right. Tom Gordon, we recognize here's the overture. It's the name of the platform. This is interesting. The name. The French being persistent, right? With the E thing. And the uh, conciliation would have said, okay. The British say, okay, we'll take the E. The E said, stands for excellence, England, Europe, the Concord, yeah. That's what the British said. A friendly understanding of the formal and informal alliance. Okay. One venture, 20 aircraft. Those are the motors. That was unique to the airplane for visibility. You know, when he rotates, get the nose up. Can't see if the nose is sticking up in your face. And uh, so for that, you can uh, land and take off. And it was really noisy. I'm gonna, I don't know if you've ever seen films of that on the flight deck. It's quite noisy when that nose is down, you get the nose up, it, it uh, gets a lot flat. Those are the specs, the Concord. All right. When you're determining the feasibility, you know, the fiscal feasibility of the platform in airplanes, it's a cost per passenger mile, right? Typically, one of the numbers you're looking at. So we can see in that period, it's, you know, half again, twice than the other primary platforms at that time. But in 97, price tag. 34 times in the normal, 10 to 15% more, but the time was cut in half. So what does that tell me? It always has, always will be. That's why, that's part of the reason there's a market for this thing. And I can tell you, along with the ego thing, we got a heavy metal, that, like the Gulfstream 6, you go, hey man, we're going to be point Mach, uh, Mach 9.92 Mach and 6,000 miles. I have the uh, fortunate experience to receive new airplanes twice. That citation, Cessna citation I told you back in 06, went to Cessna in uh, Wichita, picked up a new airplane, brought it back to Luton, and Cessna treated us very well in that experience because they said, statistically, you're going to be back. And I, two years later, went to get two new Hawker 900s and uh, got them in. Uh, our little, little Rock, same thing. Beechcraft down there, man, you're treating us like royalty. They said, we know you'll be back because the boss who bought them, uh, you know, statistically will be back to get something bigger, better, faster. So, this is the overture for him. Here's the yard's conception. And you can see the fluid design, right? That was strong for each other, you know? So, um, anyway, out of Denver, there's specs, pretty much same thing size-wise, fewer, uh, fewer, fewer packs, typically 100 on a Concorde, that many on a, on a, on a, on a liter. A little farther, same altitude. Now, the curve fuselage and gull wings is part of that aerodynamic design. Uh, and I'm going to get to the design part here in a minute. Okay. I'm going down the road to make this thing. These are factors in that process in the research design. No afterburner on this thing. Fans. Okay. So it affects the fuel rope flow, doesn't it? Okay. Advanced computational replace the testing with computer driven testing. There's where the money's saved right there. We don't have to go out and fly this thing. We'll do it on the field. And this right here said, man, whatever we show you on the computer is going to be on that flight line with a reasonable assurance. That's huge. I don't know how many drafts they went through to Concord, but they didn't say that 50 years ago. All right, the motors. That's that same kind of motor as the uh, Concorde, the thrust on the wing. Time between uh, between overall. That's what that means. Six foot fans, 10 percent lower operating cost than what? I'm not, I got this off the uh, the Boom website. Lower than what? I don't know. 
But these hall floor fan blades, those are the advantages of that. Having the court, uh, hall floor. Stable fuel, except that, how do we get so stable fuel? It's a biomass thing, right? You have to grow it. And there's energy required to grow it, all that. That's a big question mark. This is, stable. yeah, we're doing the bio thing. However, what sort of energy we, they, they, they claim a zero, car, that's big stuff these days, right? Zero, net zero carbon use loss, all that. You know, uh, I, I'm not sold on that one yet, as far as stable without energy. This is interesting. 3D printing on the motor parts. That's pretty cool. <laughs> hey man, we need a we need a, uh, a, a, a ejector. Okay, <laughs> what do you want? Here you go. <laughs> it complies with the ICAO noise levels, which is international, and also this is engine compliance with both uh, FAA and the ASA. First aircraft next year. First flight following year, generate revenue 29. That's the forecast. And if if it pans out like they're doing so far with the production facilities done well on time and all that, so as of right now, that's that's the schedule. So 2029, hope you get to the year. United bought into it three years ago. American next the following year with the option for 40 total. Or, you know, 40 more, 60 total, 50 total. This will happen. I suggest this will happen because of that. It's being funded and seeded by these two carriers. And Japan Airlines is also bought into it. Again, they only made 20 Concord. So that also, they, the Concord was developed and it was catering to a, a unique clientele, wasn't it? Somebody with money. That whole prestige thing and all that. But this tells me that. Uh, more people, it will afford, allow more people to engage the sort of price wise. I don't know, I don't I haven't heard, I haven't seen what the price tag is yet, I haven't seen that written anywhere. <laughs> Those are the specs, you can see it's pretty much the same, but in fewer packs, a little slower, a little further when you overturn. All right. <sighs> Noise is a big deal. Concord is restricted over water, right? Primarily restricted to roots. I listened to John Hutchinson, retired captain, British Airways captain, give a briefing on his experience, talking about initially when uh, British Airways was flying down to Bahrain, down that area from London, Bahrain, and then France was going down to South or, um, Buenos Aires or Brazil, or, uh, those are the routings. But they, they, they did not have permission to fly to New York yet. And they're operational. And then Johnson, once they got online with that, New York, London was their bread and butter. That was a primary route every day, twice every day. And I said, You mean you built that thing and did, you didn't get permission to fly FAA? What if FAA said no? He said, I hate to think about that. <laughs> so there's a little bit of cart for the horse, I think. More fuel efficient. Again, composites. Lighter, stable fuel. Talking defense. Um, I can envision uh, maybe easing into the hypersonic realm, if you will, because that's the thing on the horizon. The military is hi uh, hypersonic. You all know about that. That would be hypersonic. You all make a storm shadow here, right? We're going to see a little bit of operational test on that here in a couple weeks. All right. There you go. <clears throat> Comparison. Two guys, not three. Far less buttons. They had a flight deck demonstrator down at Farnborough back in June, July, whenever the air show was. And they invited a bunch of British Airways captains to come fly that thing. And like any MLUs, you know, what? It was a G Wiz experience for them, you know. Uh, so we need to just look at it and see. But some of the differences are you can feel what's going on with the stick, make the input. Auto land on it, augmented the reality vision, forward looking vision to uh, whether it's bad, whatever. Again, don't have to look over the nose, sort of thing.
this, I couldn't believe they put this on the website that when I got to take this off the page. So you can have the vision, eliminate the need for the group nodes, and also safely land with our web or our computer and rather use. Uh, wait, that's not the one. It's what I'm talking about it. Uh, so you can use screens, eliminate all the breakers and buttons and all that. It's right here on the, on the glass. It's all set for the call, but you can also have this control like the state of the main here for safety related functions. Yeah, like Lanny. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Yeah, man, we'll give you a stick. Okay. Okay. So I had to put that up there. That was on their website. Over here, referees being cut, you know, in real time. They get the update, boom, farm it out. However, they're allowing us to load out when, whatever. Again, that's a large rendition, but that's pretty much what the, uh, that's in North Carolina, the production facility, and also a reception center for United Native American in Japan to collect these airplanes, fly them home. They finished it this summer. They're going to do 33 a year. They're going to do 66 a year when they made another one, another facility. But that's just okay. Okay. Come back in a couple, three years, and I'll tell you how it went. <laughs> All right, this uh, test vehicle with NASA, the testing um, reports from sonic boom, if you will, and hypersonic travel. And again, this guy, he doesn't look out the front window. There is no front window. All his forward views is off the screen. But what they're looking at, reducing signature from report on the uh, sonic boom to the point where the goal is that when you hear it, it'll be equivalent to the car door shut at the decimal level. Anyway, so hypersonic uh, travel, hypersonic by definition, five Mach five and greater. <clears throat> All right. I suggest this was the beginning of the end for Concord, Paris, 2000. Most of you in the room look like you were around when that happened. Probably saw it on the news. Tragic, but the tragedy in all this I'm fixing to present to you was man made. Very poor decisions by the captain. And I'll show you. Basic scenario. The highlights of Captain Hutchinson bring up. Bring up. They're making a trip to New York to get on a boat to go down through the Panama Canal to go to Sydney for the Olympics. Trip of a lifetime. Big bags. 19 of the bags did not get loaded for overdose. And the captain knows what the trip is to the pack and back. He put the bags on. They did. They put them in the outhole. Now you've got overdose, FCG, strike two. It gets worse. Um, there was an inspection item that they did a uh, maintenance, a minor maintenance on the left trunnion. It was a, a, a stabilizer on the left main gear that was in, improperly installed. But the first officer doing a walk around unable to see that. So that's a okay. However, when they hit the lip of the unprepared surface, because you took the whole runway and they're repairing the runway and they hit this lip, that kind of talk, because there were reports of smoke right after that, meaning the gear, the, the wheels dragging. Uh, of note, in this, Captain Hutchinson got a hold of one of his Air France buddies, who, I don't know if he was in that 747 or a senior captain with Air France. There was a 747 sitting on the left side of the runway, waiting to cross, had the president of France and his wife in the back. And Captain Hutchinson's talking to this Captain Pierre. Hey, Captain, tell me about this. This Concord is being in the two bed over our head at 20 feet. And Captain Hutchinson said, Oh, you must be in 20 meters. No, Captain, 20 feet, six meters. And I remember that pilot to figure out what 20 feet is right over your head. And that kind of, from a pilot's perspective, I, I, I try to put myself in that position now. How did they get there? And from that aspect is, okay, 
rotate 150 or V1 155, rotate 190, whatever, and V2 is in the you know 220, whatever. So the halfway between V1 and rotate, boom, there's blowout, get the lights. Uh, and what is that? And he see now they start dragging, you know, dragging off the left from the gear, right? And the blown tire. Uh, uh, so now he's dragging left. He sees the 747 right off his nose. What's he going to do about it? He's going to rotate. He prematurely rotates. Now he's behind the power curve. And that's what put him there at 200 knots the rest of the trip. Really, that's two minutes, what it was. So when he rotate prematurely, all that drag over the wing, he never got out of that drag. He only got to 200 feet or so in 200 knots. And he did that. And the left wing basically burned off. Then he got to throttle back on a right motor to keep him over control. Minimum, uh, you know, minimum uh, thrust. Bad all the way around. Um, but that 20 feet thing, Made a lot worse. Okay. Overweight. FCG. He filled the tanks to capacity. They don't do that. Typically 85%. Got budget room in there, right? Well, he's got full tanks, and the, doing his research on this thing found that it, it was not a puncture, it was a burst. Because when that they hit that titanium strip doing mock stink, that strip goes up into tank number five. In the left wing, and it, it hits, or the, it, or no, take that back, it, it, it cut a chunk of rubber, four and a half kilograms, that four and a half kilograms, but slamming up into tank five, created a shock wave, and that's what burst the tank. It wasn't a function. Okay. And he, he prematurely set the uh, pumps going aft forward, so they got the fuel coming aft, pushing forward, and it was uh, um, I'm thinking he he filled it full because he was in the hurry up get go mode. Hey, we got a boat to meet, we got a boat to meet in New York. We can be doing this, I think. Um, hour delayed for a TR cross reversal issue. They're late, so he's in a hurry up get go mode, right? All right. This is that titanium strip. The French authorities, by reg, are required to do a fog check on the runway. Just before Concord takes off every time, they did not do that. Had they done that, they probably would have seen the titanium strip was about that long, about that wide, whatever. They would have seen that. Okay. This exemplifies the concept of a chain of events in any aircraft accident, or any accident that way. If you pluck any item out of that chain, probably not going to happen. That's one of them. If they had done their required check, that would have happened. Or not, you have a fog check. Takes a four and a half kilogram chunk, goes up into tank five. Um, I don't know where that comes from, but yeah. Shock wave. And then fuel ignited in the left uh, gear, gear wall. Left main gear wall. Okay. Repeat 200 knots all day. The left wing is burned off the airplane from the fire. So he's not only, and one thing too is say they, they had full power in one, one and two. And number two is showing a fire indication, but it was not, it was still producing thrust. It was enshrouded in the plane, so it's giving a hot indication, hence the, 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 the cut number two. And I've heard both ways, but I heard that, and Captain Hutchins says that, flight engineer uh, shut that motor down on command, and that's a gross foul. You don't do anything like that without Captain saying so. Of course, you got a hand for uh, And then, yeah, it depends. Okay. Yeah, they started to roll back, whatever. They got max thrust on the right, decreasing thrust and lift on the left. They got to power back on the right to maintain control, all right? Minimum control airspeed. So it's, again, comp uh, compounding uh, issue. Pull back on power on three and four. Not good. Okay. Overgross, FCG. Saw that. They, don't, they didn't train for losing two motors or losing this sort of scenario, and I equate that to, you all familiar with the uh, hero on the Hudson with Sully Sullivan and the uh, Airbus 320, those two birds, the uh, pocket birds, 200 plane out. And since I have a little more time right now, because Joan's not talking, um, I will mention one thing about that uh, episode, and when Tom Hanks makes the movie, I'll watch anything Tom Hanks does, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
first officer's driving, this guy also think his name, and they're three or four thousand feet right after takeoff, boom, uh, bird strike, the winds of failure. And in the movie, if you recall, right after the bird strike, the camera went between the crew and is looking forward, and there was a pregnant pause. And then Sully says, I got it. <laughs> I'll take it from here. Uh, that's true. That happens because, and Sully learned that in the Air Force. When I was taught, if you have an emergency, wind the clock. Don't be yanking on buttons and throttles and this and that. Analyze the situation and take off rash. Well, which motor is it? You now, this sort of thing, because when you, these lights are staring you in the face, you might tend to get a little irrational, a little excited. Wind the clock, and that's what they were doing. So, in winding that clock, get the nose down, and go fly. First thing Sully did was hit the APU, boom, because he knew he needed power, right? Okay, good, good for the foresight. He turns and looks back to LaGuardia, no, can't make it. His butt tells him he cannot make it. He looks over to you across the river. Nope, can't make that one either. We're going in the water. It's the only open space in a Harvard Rock degree, which is Manhattan. And so they go in the water. What I found interesting in that thing, this uh, story, is that between the incident and the NTSB hearing, however many months later, uh, Sully and his first officer had time to commiserate, review this thing, audit the diamond. And, then, and I saw Sully interviewed uh, when a movie came out, and he shared that in that period, he started, he was wanting to be made the right call. He started to doubt his confidence. And that is the worst thing for a pilot, is to doubt yourself. So as it turned out, he was right because in the NTSB hearing, they said, well, our captain's all over. We ran that scenario through the simulator 17 times. We got back to Guardia. Well, it's got to sell her. We, we got everything. We got data that says the right motor was idling into the water. So when it was Somberger's turn to talk, he said, well, you didn't, you didn't account for the human element. What's that? Oh, the unplanned, unbrief scenario that we experienced. And in that period, devising a plan of action, sticking to it. And they said, oh, okay, we're going to give you 34 seconds, which I thought was a lot. They went back to see they couldn't do it, they couldn't get the table, they couldn't get the move board, they couldn't, because Sullenberg had been flying so long, his butt told him he could not do it, and he was right. And oh, by the way, when they pulled that motor out of water, it was not right. It was, it was out. It was so that was a really interesting uh, story about pilot reaction from a very seasoned pilot. He became Mr. Safety, Air Safety for the U.S. for a long time. I think he, Kind of easy now, now, but he is Mr. Air Safety back in the States, it was. And again, they did not, there was no training for that scenario in any Part 121 carrier. Okay, don't abort V1. Why is that? Why do we not abort above V1? Anybody? anybody? Not enough runway remaining. That's why you have it. It's a bunch of climatic conditions, you know, density, altitude, what's going on. You determine the V1 speed. Anything past that, we got to go. Because there's not enough runway to stop after that. <sighs> yeah, damn it. Yeah, left wing was falling off of this thing in the course of a couple of minutes. Right there. Right over the left main gear. That's what they carry, that's what they burn. And I got a G whiz, neat little how you doing here once it relaxes. So, center of lift and center of gravity, center of lift changes as you go through the mountain. We're going to adjust our, our CG, center of gravity, to accommodate that. And that's why they pay that flight engineer the big bucks. Don't screw that one up. And I've always heard that's the, one of the most critical functions in this airplane is doing that. Again, going through the mark and coming back out of the mark and keeping and staying balanced. That's where I would have had Captain Hutchinson talk, but uh, he, again, he's over at the, uh, the, the Concord there in Duxbury. He's up on the flight deck sharing his insight from a pilot's perspective. And he goes on about the scenario with the Germans, uh, the hurry up, get go, the, uh, and the bad calls by the captain. And these were not challenged by the flight crew. He doesn't elaborate on that. I have another briefing that I give on uh, his runway incursions. And, um, 
a lot of a lot of you here also were in the room in uh, March 1977 in Tenerife when KLM went slamming into Pan, Pan American 372 white bodies, 580 people outright dead, and that captain of KLM was uh, found to be the primary issue in this. He was Mr. 747 for KLM. He was a training captain. He received the first 747. He was a god for KLM, and he wore it right here. And he and with these videos, you see, he portrays that attitude. Um, and that's back when the culture was nobody dis, uh, disputes the captain. That still goes on in Asia. When I was flying in my mind. Yep, that still goes on up there. But CRM, crew resource management, that evolved out of that uh, 19th uh, KLM incident. Uh, and United Airlines was the first to implement that concept, meaning, okay, yeah, the captain still has the authority and final say so. However, comma, he or she will, you know, solicit information from the crew and any other source to make the most informed decision, if you will. And again, in, in uh, Korean Air, Japan Air, whatever, yeah, they do that in the training center. You get on a flight line, mm -mm. Act to ops on, yeah, the captain is the boss. And there was some of that in this incident where uh, they're questioning maybe the downwind takeoff. Uh, but anyway, they're kind of squeamish, the, the, the first officer and the flight engineer, because his captain, you know, he's got his stuff together. So there was a little bit of that. Team events. Tanks filled with max full, no room for shockwave when a five kilogram piece of rubber slams into the tank. He takes extra fuel for taxi, which they do not use because they, he elects for a downwind takeoff. Really? <laughs> and that's been, Hutchinson emphasizes that. That is a gross foul because that on paper, computationally puts him six to seven tons over gross for takeoff, downwind takeoff. And had he made a normal headwind takeoff, he wouldn't have hit the tiny X2 that way. Right? Okay. Yeah, the flight delayed TRs, and um, we talked about that. That went into the captain's mind about loading the bags, push it up, don't miss the boat. So you can see where that external pressure in his mind affected his poor decision making. Bags on, overgrowth, over wraps, FCG. Down, you know, right off to the end of the runway. Okay, there was a lip in the runway because they were repairing it. And so he hits that lip and the trunnion starts wobbling and that's what I think starts him dragging off to the left. That was right after, it, it was, uh, B1 was 150 or, uh, and rotate was 190, halfway between 170 knots. So he's halfway there and here we go. Um, 10 knot tailwind, six, seven ton over gross. Computation purpose, right? So that was a gross error. That's a gross foul. And decisions like that, got to be, I would imagine, no, maybe to be uh, some responsible for that. In whatever litigation, whatever, of course, he's not here to experience it, but I'm just saying that poor decision like that, that's why uh, carriers have big insurance policies, I guess. Um, oh, here we go. Captain Culture, their, their mom was, I'm not going to make me to argue that. This was 2000. CRM had been well implemented by them, and this was a Western crew. So I don't know what was going on. Anyway, V speeds. This that's a rocket ship. V two. I, I never was an airplane with a V two of 220 knots. Yeah, jet of flight aircraft. That's not bad. Um. Okay. Halfway to rotate, to hit the titanium strip. They didn't expect the runway. These, again, are the chain of events to cause this. Rubber goes slammed up tank five. Burst the tank, electric spark. There you go. That was the uh, tracking device that was not inspected, unable to view it in the pre-flight. But again, maintenance fault there. Would have affected, you know, real, okay, let's walk through that one. Okay, they hit the bump. Which I think started them off to the left, which took them over the titanium strip. How far down? I don't know. 
if the tracking gear was installed properly, and even if they hit the bump, they would have tracked straight, maybe not hit that strip, but even though he would have been tracking straight down the runway and would have waited until rotate, so he's not rotating behind the power curve, that could have saved him. Because then you get airborne, shut down, and maybe get over to Dick. Because in this scenario, that little, the first officer's calling, Le Bourget, Le Bourget, which is, I don't know, five or six miles off 10 o'clock, something like that. They could have maybe ditched it over in there. Who knows? But that right there, the tracking device, if that wasn't a, a fault, that this may not happen. Again, it's these, it's the chain link. It's the chain of events. Chain of events. You break any link in that, and it, it's probably not gonna happen. All right. It's the fire enveloping the engine that causes the indication, but the engine is still producing thrust, all right? And without captain's direction, the flight engineer shuts it down. That's a gross error. Spank for that. Fuel depletion increases the FCG, even though they got the pumps going, because all the fuel's coming right out of the you know, middle of the aircraft, so the fuel in the back is exacerbating the FCG, right? And then the left wing just disintegrating from the fire, goes off in a hotel two miles down the road. All right. I again suggest that that incident was the beginning of the end for Concord, a couple of reasons. Uh, okay, 9-11 happened, that wasn't in the, the plan, but that that unique clientele who fly that thing, they see that, I'm not getting on that airplane, because it's not the general flying public, it's a unique clientele, and they say, well, I'm not gonna get on that, so you just lost your client base, right? And then Air France quits in 03, they understand there was an agreement between the UK and France, that we both operate the same because we don't have the financials to operate solo. And if one or the other backs out, there's room for, and I, I, I read that the UK was considering litigation in that sense because Air France fell out, they didn't pursue it, but uh, then a few months later, that's it, they're done. Spinny flight out to Bristol. Uh, over 20 years ago. Main points of this. Put this down. Mm -hmm. uh, is somebody along the line back in the 60s, UK and France collaborative effort, and I, I think it was a little more of a science project than a fiscal. It, there was national pride involved in this thing, right? We're the only ones doing it. We're doing it safely, efficiently. We're about well, the wilds, they're efficient, it's expensive. So there was that idea about it. And he only made 20 of them. It was kind of like a test thing. Now, United and American have done their market research to determine it's a viable thing. The road they're going down. And I'm sure Boom Aviation and Denver's are glad to hear that. To the extent that they're going to make another facility and double the output. Incredible. So uh, I think the, the uh, incentive, the, the, the direct Coupled with this boom, this uh, overture, that thing I told you about, United buying all those airplanes, putting all those pilots in the cockpit, again, they are forecasting an increase in the market. Uh, so again, I can see the differences on the two ventures, if you will. One was more of a, gee whiz, this really cool science project, and this one is, hey, we're gonna make money, and it will. Don't make money out. 